welcome here to this special edition of Husker Online uh, Live. Usually this is our Monday night uh, rundown show with Jeff Cameron, but we've had a lot of news in Lincoln, as you know, with the hiring of new head football coach Matt Rule here today. Sean Callahan of Husker Online, Robin Washett, Stephen Sipple, en route to the studio. He was finishing up a couple stories, so uh, he likes to push the time, but Sipple will be on within five minutes. And then later in the show, we're going to be joined by Jim Rose as uh, we talk more about the day that was for Nebraska football. All the coverage on Husker Online is up, by the way. So if you want to get on while we're talking, um, we've got some breaking news, Sipple's column, Robin's Five Things, all the videos, photo gallery, former player reaction, um, on the message board, tons of great conversations. So check out Husker, excuse me, online.com as uh, we've got tons of great things posted already from today's coverage here in Lincoln. we got a great special as well. $25 gets you one year of HuskerOnline.com. But, Robin, um, let's get into it. Uh, Matt Rule today spoke at 1.30. Um, it was a really, really well done, presented press conference uh, over in the Hawks Indoor Center, uh, staged up, lit up, um, you know, everything you'd kind of want to see from a big-time event. And, um, you know, we've been through some of these uh, deals where the guy gets up and he just kind of wings his opening comments. Uh, doesn't have a lot prepared. Matt Rule was very prepared. Um, he's a true CEO, captivated the room. This is a guy that you can tell in a living room is going to go a long way uh, when he speaks with recruits and their families. And uh, it was a really, really good first impression uh, for a guy that many Nebraskans didn't know much about until he stepped foot in this state today. Yeah, if you go back to Trev's first press conference after – Scott Frost was fired. One of the things he said was, I'm not, not looking for somebody to win the press conference. Well, whether that's what he wanted or not, that's exactly what Matt Rule did. Um, he he hit a home run um, just with his message, his delivery, the confidence, um, the way he commanded the room, said all of the right things, everything Nebraska fans wanted to hear, both on the field, how he's going to structure his staff, his emphasis on recruiting, um, keeping Nebraska football traditions uh, at the forefront. Um, of how he's going to build this program. I mean, really everything that if you're a Nebraska fan, you wanted to hear Matt rule said it. And so um, first day on the job, pretty darn good start. Now, as Sip uh, wrote in his column tonight, uh, now the hard part begins. He's got a lot of work to do and it's going to be hitting the ground running here um, over these, this next first week uh, is going to be critical as far as figuring out the staff, re-recruiting the current roster, um, you know, figuring out what they're going to do with the transfer portal. And then, um, you know, here in a few days, uh, official visit season begins on the second and then the portal opens up shortly after that. So uh, they're, they're off and running right now, but like I said, for, for a first impression, I don't know if Matt rule could have done much better. Yeah. A lot of moving parts uh, between hiring a new staff meeting with the current Nebraska staff and kind of trying to figure things out questions about Mickey Joseph. I know that's going to come up in the comments. What's Mickey Joseph going to do or what's Matt rule going to do with Mickey Joseph. Um, I can tell you, um, you know, I, I've had some communication with a source close to Mickey Joseph um, and Matt Rule confirmed this as well. That they, they have not had that formal meeting. That there's been communication, uh, but I think a lot of it is can these two get on the same page uh, for Mickey Joseph to stay at Nebraska? Um, I think it's got to make sense for him and he's got to, you know, you got to want to do it. And there could be other opportunities out there as well. So, um, you know, would it be a good thing for Mickey Joseph to stay? Absolutely. Is it a guarantee right now? No. And um, that will be something I think we'll probably know really within 24 hours. Uh, there have already been some staff movement. Um, and if you go on Husker Online, Trey, pull up on our front page uh, the headline, um, strength coach Zach Duvall and nutritionist Dave Ellis, along with uh, the entire strength and conditioning staff, uh, they were let go today. Um, that's the only staff movement that's happened as of now. Um, and, and that's going to happen. I mean, I think everybody that's been a part of coaching changes at Nebraska, um, they understand that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of things happen with people's jobs uh, when they move on. Now, they they did have another – two people came with Matt Rule Robin to Nebraska mm -hmm. today that we know of for sure that are on this coaching staff right now. Um, Carolina assistant – defensive line coach Terrence Knight. Now, he wasn't here today, uh, but Corey Campbell was here at Nebraska today. Um, strength coach. And he's going to be the strength coach from all accounts. He addressed the team today in the weight room as the new strength coach. So um, is he the main strength coach? That's what it appears to be. And then the other big piece that was hired, um, Evan Cooper mm -hmm. is a cornerbacks coach, a recruiting coordinator. 
He's been the one button pusher behind the scenes for Matt Rule. He's made a lot of recruiting offers, a lot of new Twitter follows. Um, so Evan Cooper's on the staff. We know those three. And then the offensive coordinator piece, Robin, was hired today. Marcus Satterfield from South Carolina um, will presumably make over a million dollars and be on a three-year contract um, at Nebraska as an offensive coordinator. Yeah, and so uh, the, a lot of pieces already falling into place here. Um, like I said, they – Time is of the essence here, so to get a pretty good jump on the on the staff is critical. Um, but still, some very big questions remaining. And you know, it, it starts for a lot of people um, with Mickey Joseph. Um, that's about as big as it gets right now, as far as potential coaches being retained from the previous staff. And you know, I, it's hard to really get a sense on that right now because obviously there is a lot of value with keeping Mickey, just with. Um, you know, his presence on the team, the relationship he has with the players, uh, his uh, profile as a recruiter um, with the current class and then with future recruits and then his connections that he's developed uh, around the state uh, with the Nebraska football community. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of reasons why Matt Rule would want to keep Mickey Joseph. But, um, you know, the, the other side to that is, you know, there's probably some some things got to work out. I'm sure Mickey is going to want to be paid what he feels is worth. He's worth um, to Nebraska specifically just because of all those reasons. And yes, uh, Matt Rule has a seven million dollar budget, I believe, for his assistant coaching pool for all 10 full time assistants. That's a lot of money to toy around with. And so the money is potentially there. But you also have to wonder who else does Matt Rule have his sights set on? Um, there's been a lot of rumors linking him to some elite-level coaches around the country. Um, Elijah Robinson from Texas A&M is getting a lot of smoke uh, on the message board Twitter world right now, um, and he was just rated the number one recruiter in all of college football this season. So um, you know, there's just a lot of things we don't know about. One, Mickey's interest in working with Matt Rule, and then Matt Rule's interest in having a personality like Mickey uh, on the staff, because you go back to what he talked about during his press conference today. He said, you know, as long as everybody's willing to pull the rope the same direction, be completely bought into what we're doing, I'm all for all in on listening to those coaches. But I've, when I've not had success, it's when we've had people that are in it for their own reasons. And so I think that's where these conversations, when he and Matt Rule, Mickey Joseph and Matt Rule do sit down and kind of lay everything out. That's going to be, I think, the defining factors. Does Matt Rule truly believe Mickey is 100% bought in to his vision and doing things his way? And is Mickey uh, 100% bought into to doing it vice versa? So a lot of unknowns there that we'll probably get answers here within the next day or two. What do you think? Hey, yeah, Sip, thanks for joining and, uh, us. Steve Sipple <laughs> in the house. He's going to get hooked up here. We had some uh, wings delivered from our neighbor's Mellow Mushroom. I think he was eyeballing those wings, Robin. He was. They were good. I've never yeah, had really wings from actually Mellow underrated wings that they will, they will be called again. We yeah. were kind of in a pinch um, because you don't really have time to leave the office and we're right across the street from the hay market. So we picked up clutch um, a little mellow mushroom. So thank you for, for that. But yeah, if, if you're just joining us, this is the Husker online, normally our Monday night rundown show with Jeff Cameron. Uh, we will have Jim Rose on later though. Um, I know Jim Rose has been money throughout this process, but uh, there's so much to talk about right now um, as we kind of sift through. Um, but the staff, I think, you know, you mentioned it. Of all the stories we've done, that has been the story that gets the most interest from our readers. Um, our staff hot board breakdown of just potential names is over 200,000 premium page views. Are, are, you're not on mic yes. yet, Sip. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Sip, sip. Right, let's put your mic there. there you go. Simple's on. Mute your mic. No. Sophisticated. Mute your mic. Okay, you're muted. Sean Good. always says I need to be more sophisticated. <laughs> you're just looking at those wings. I, I'm smelling them. Hey, hey, now what's, uh, is there any updates on the assistant coaching situation? <sighs> no. And, you know, I thought Come it was on, Sean. Matt Rule today, I think, wants to give the other staff members, you know, the opportunity to talk to him probably first before he formalizes anything. But this is what we know. Mark Whipple was on a plane out of Lincoln yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, and we did see that one of our yeah. one of our RSS sleuths, sleuths baby subscribers <laughs> did a love snipe it. shot of Mark Whipple on a plane leaving town, I'm flying so. southwest. From all I'll those. tell you what, you guys, you young guys are really good at those snipe shots. I've noticed. I've I don't like a that. few of you. I don't like. Our... I know. I don't like that. <laughs> you don't like snipes. Hey, now hold on. Now, so we don't have any updates on Mickey Joseph. Not Nothing. Not um, yet. you know, and I think Matt Rule made it sound like that, that those conversations would come. Um, so 
you know, Casey Thompson talked, um, you know, and said all the right things. Uh, but I, I, I think they need to get their sea legs underneath them. There's so many things that have to get done this right. week. You've got to figure out your staff. You got to figure out what players are going to go in the portal and what guys are staying. And you got to figure out what commits are committed. What if Mickey Joseph's not a part of the staff? Do other guys leave? Um, you know, there's other recruits. You know, and, and we have not heard from all the recruits. A lot of them have responded to us. Uh, but a lot Matt, of them are or not. Um, have but have. you know some have not. So I think a lot of guys are in wait and see, um, trying to figure things out with the coaching staff. But signing day is December 21st. Mm-hmm. It is right around the corner. Yeah, and so, and as you reported, or you guys have reported, the coaches, Matt Rule and his staff, whoever that is, go out on the road on Friday. Yep. They can start making, Sean, they can make official in-home visits on Friday. Yeah, it it opens back up. So you can have visitors in that weekend. Now, my guess. Wait a second. Can they go on the road? Yes. Yes. Coaches can also host visitors. So my guess is Friday, Matt Rule is going to go out locally and see as many people as he can get the, the commits locally in, in the in state or okay. maybe Kansas city like Jaden Doss. But I think you've got to get Matt rule out as much as you can. And then, you know, you could potentially have recruits in this weekend, but maybe he's going to do a lot more in-home visits. Now the next weekend, I think not this weekend, but the following weekend, which is December 9th weekend, that will be a huge recruiting weekend. I think all of your current committed players, mm-hmm. they'll come in that weekend. Okay, That's how I kind of understand the lay of the land. Um, but we don't know like the inner workings of how the back end of the staff is going to go because you're going to have new chefs in the kitchen. You know, They might have different thoughts, different ways of wanting to do things. How many of the Frost, Joseph, back end staff members are going to be involved helping to get to signing day versus not because you might need those guys to help you at least get through signing day. And maybe rule wants to evaluate a couple of those back in staff members, meaning the recruiting back in okay. staff, yeah. you know, and like his, the Vince Ginta's of the world. Yeah. Vince Ginta. I mean, will Vince Ginta be part of this show? Well, Vince hard. Ginta heads the recruiting department right now on paper. You'd like, he'd have a chance because he was at Baylor, but he was at Baylor with Dave Aranda. Oh, he was, with uh, he had no affiliation with Matt rule. And, the problem, you know, when you have that high profile of position that pays high, you know, you're a big target in a deal like this. And we saw that today. And, and we just hit on this earlier, Sip, but um, our story on Husker Online with Zach Duvall, the strength coach, and his staff, um, and then nutritionist Dave Ellis, um, they were removed. I mean, they they were surprising relieved of their on, duties. It's a little surprising to me. Well, not, not Duvall. I mean, a head coach is always going to bring in a new strength coach. I mean, right. that the head coach and the strength coach re- really got to be intertwined. They got to be arm and arm. Yeah, because basically the strength coach is the head coach in the off season, like exactly. during the winter. For, so I, for how many you, months? You better year? trust that guy. Yeah, for how many months a year? Now, I thought maybe Ellis would be someone you'd consider, but um, usually, let's face it. I mean, rule was brought in. He's going to clean most of the house, right? Yeah, I was told Saturday morning from a high-ranking person within the the former regime. Now you'd call him. That you know, at best, eighty five percent. I mean, eight, you're going to see eighty five percent of people probably moved out. Fifteen percent no. kept, and that that's probably best case scenario. And and that's realistic. I mean, remember when Mike Riley came here? I mean, they just bring you. They just bring everybody in to a conference room, you know. And you know, if you're not a key assistant, they they fire you kind of in a HR manner in a conference room, and mm-hmm. and that's it. So, mm-hmm. uh, but I, I think it was. I mean, I. It was a rough deal today. I, I don't know if a guy like Dave Ellis probably was expecting to be, you know, escorted out of the building like that today. I mean, it, it, it's 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 never easy. It, it's tough. I mean, mm-hmm. Dave Ellis is a Nebraskan. He's part of the national championship teams, and um, but he had a high. I mean, what, what did you report? Two sixty six. He was making two two hundred sixty six thousand a year. One of the highest uh, nutritionists in in the game. Um, so you know that that's highest a, paid. Yeah. Uh, that that's a um, that's a big that's a big amount of money i'm sure you know a guy like rule is going to have his own thoughts on how he wants to do things and ellis almost was a part of strength and conditioning his office was next to zach devall's yeah. you know i think if he would have isolated himself as a different area of of the operation you know maybe it's different but he almost you know presented himself as a part of the strength staff having an office right next to the strength coach right. yeah that's i mean dave ellis there's not many nutritionists in the country that have as big a name as Dave Ellis. I mean, he's he almost was, like a, he was a big deal. He was LeBron he James's nutritionist. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. There's Dave Ellis there with the the '90s guys, but you know he'll he'll find work. I mean, 
He, oh, yeah. He, yeah. You know, but I think he, you know, you, you feel for all these guys because mm-hmm. I'm sure they all said, I'm coming back home and I'm not leaving. I know. It's, it, it's, it's hard easy. for every, but that, that's big time college athletics. What did you guys have? You guys talked about the news right. conference today? Yeah. Just gave our initial takes. I, my take was, uh, you know, it was day one on the job officially and did about as well as you possibly could have. And, but I kind of referenced your point in your column that uh, a lot of work now needs to be done within a very short amount of time. Yeah. He's really dynamic, isn't he? I mean, he's very charismatic. He's son of a minister. I'm sure he's seen his dad at the podium many times. Uh, He he looked like it. Yeah. He was very (laughs) comfortable. Uh, I was struck by it. I was struck by it. And and now what's it mean? It doesn't mean that much. I mean, it doesn't, we've been, we've seen this whole podium game here and Mike Riley was impressive. I thought Bill Callahan was Mike Riley. Wasn't that impressive. I thought she was impressive. Sean, in his own smiling way, Um, (laughs) in his own warm way. Mainly just because of the contrast from his predecessor. Like, <laughs> right. Remember? So yeah, yeah, yeah. His predecessor being Bo Pelini. He made you feel warm and fuzzy compared to Bo. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, Bo, even at his <laughs> initial press conference, was was smiley and warm. Uh, Bill Callahan was impressive. Um, so what's the, I thought this was the most impressive. Frost like, was per, impressive. I thought this was the most prepared Yeah. speech we've seen, though. Yeah, yeah. He, and it was presented the best. And it, it was wasn't really a bunch of play. fluff either. Like really he wasn't. got right down to it and yeah. laid out his plan and pretty, I mean, not like overly specific, but compared to other opening statements, uh, detailed. Yeah. You know, he, he talked about what his emphasis were. And a lot of it was like what you would expect take care of the ball, you know, build the trenches. But like you could see that he has a, a, a plan for how to establish that based on his past experience. Right. And I like that he said, t- a couple times that this is going to be hard. I mean, this is, this is going to be difficult. I mean, he, he, it is going to be hard. He took on a major challenge here. Now he's, he's well compensated. Now, did you guys were, are you pretty convinced that he was one a like, like Trev said, Trev said, and Ted Carter both said it that. seems that way. It I does. Mean, it, you know, like Mark Stoops, his agent, Jimmy Sexton might've used just the sniff of being one of the 13 people that were talked to, to get the contract. You know, because the information that Treb knew, there's no way like Kentucky's going to know that. So I'm sure that happened. Yeah, I, my, and we'll never maybe know. But where was Fickle at? Like, I clear- don't know. Has anybody report? I mean, I saw the Athletic reported that Nebraska showed interest in Fickle. Would Fickle? The question is like, would Fickle have taken this job over Wisconsin? Nebraska would have paid a lot more money than Wisconsin, right? Now, now see, those are the. I mean, we'll never people, know. No, we'll never know. People I've noticed get angry when I raise that. Um, I don't know why you get angry. I mean, is, isn't that part of this discussion? I mean, all 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 that went down with Fickle at, at Wisconsin in that late hour, right? Is Nebraska? I mean, it, I mean, the, the stories are kind of intertwined. I just thought Ted Carter and Trev Alberts really emphasizing that rule was our our first choice. Ronnie Green said that too. Ronnie Green said he backed it. it up. I mean, that that pretty much. I think it answer it. It's sort of renders moot the fickle discussion this is their this is their number one well the amount of money they're paying him it tells you he was their first choice now some people will not believe them they'll be they'll be skeptical of that but i don't know those guys were all i I thought they were fairly convinced what's funny is we i had people messaging me about fickle with connections to cincinnati and, and they just said people that have worked with him for a long time this is going into black friday weekend like that he's acting differently. Like there's something going on. He called off a meeting that never normally would have been called off. Right. And so like you knew something was going on there. Um, but man, talk about the Big Ten. Well, the Athletic reported that Fickle, that that Cincinnati administrators have known for weeks that he was looking for, a, that he was looking at other jobs that, and that Nebraska and Wisconsin have shown interest. Now people at this point are probably saying, all right, let's not talk about fickle. This is a, yeah, let's, uh, I want to get back. We don't need to, we don't I want to get back on track about just the different presentation that, that rule had today compared to say frost and, and even Riley. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, but you think about five years ago, frost is like, don't talk about my family. They're off limits. Um, Right out of the game. I, I don't want to see, you know, he kind of just said, I don't really want to see you, and we're not going to be in the public. We're going to be private. Um, and none of his family was at the press conference. Is that right? They weren't there? None. I mean, okay. and to be fair, it was after the AAC the next day. He just had a baby. After the AAC. They won the championship. Oh, after the AAC championship game? In, in oh, yeah. 2017. 
Um, so, you know, they, they, but his mom and dad weren't there. I mean, his brother wasn't there. I mean, it was just him. Remember he just came in and, and did it. You know, Mike Riley, when he came, it, it was him and his wife showed up in a hooded sweatshirt. Um, and she slept on a couch and, you know, wasn't really done up and ready where, mm -hmm. You know, no, she, what do you mean she slept on a couch well she said i think she took a nap on a couch i mean she just where you compare it to today mm -hmm. you know rule his whole family and and you know the way they came up presented themselves said hey and we're going to be in the community yes we're going to be yes. at restaurants he really stressed that my wife's yeah, going to be involved he you're going to you're going to get to know she's going to run like charity organizations right. like uh, quickly yeah he said the words will not exist in seclusion mm -hmm. and and that seemed like a pretty what pre uh premeditated yeah. deal but that was a mistake by frost i, I think was. by going in the bunker mm -hmm. it didn't really give him a lot of what grace allies grace grace you know it just where rule i think came out of the gates and 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 wanted people to know that and he also commended his wife I, I, a lot of women in the state when he said hey i, I couldn't do this without my wife you know mm -hmm. she um drove the van 12 hours yeah Got a couple hours of sleep, ironed all the clothes, got the kids ready for today. And, you know, I couldn't be here like this without her. Right. You know, I think if you're a woman that hears that, you're like, thank you. Like, well, and she encouraged him to take the job. Yeah, she was a huge part of it. Yeah. Her she and her, her right. and his son. Yep. And they yeah, came, he has a son that's going to be a senior, senior in high school. And he was like, let's do whatever. You know, like, don't worry about me. Come on, dad. They're going to pay you eight million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Nine million. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure his wife, I got a, sure his wife I got a future to look out for here. Come on, dad. <laughs> I'm sure his wife didn't mind that at all. <laughs> Let's face it. My man. wife would be smiling. Absolutely. Anybody like him, I mean, guys like that, they, they don't want to be at home. Like, probably not. Like, everyone's like, probably. oh, just sit around and, and lay on the couch and golf. Like, right. guys that are wired like that, it's hard to just not be a hundred percent dialed in everybody's a little different though i mean i there's coaches like Pelini's fine i mean he doesn't he doesn't need to work there's not everybody's the same like that god i was told for 90 days to stay out of the job this summer for stuff we had to deal with with husker online and that was hard you out uh, you were at the pool all the time sean no no <laughs> sipping my ties i was Those running the fire thorn people knew was, you pretty well i was running the, the cartel from prison <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but hey we got a super let's get we got a super chat and if yeah. you've got a super chat we'll get you on right away uh jeremy has one can you tell us anything about nelson garrett nelson or any other players transferring now sean go ahead uh, i a will say talk about nelson. starting saturday i had two different sources okay the highest ranking type sources you could have within the program tell me that keep your eyes on garrett nelson you know like he's keeping his options open and okay. You know, options open meaning not pro could potentially look at the portal. Now, could that yeah, we're talking about another college? Yeah. Change. Could that change with meeting Matt Rule, talking to Matt Rule, meeting the new defensive coordinator? Absolutely. That's big, I think though. emotions are high mm -hmm. right now because mm -hmm. uh, O'Shawn Mathis, they also expect him to go pro from. They do. He O'Shawn has another year, but it would make sense for him to to go into the draft process mm -hmm. maybe get to the combine but sean i mean that news you got about garrett nelson's gigantic that resonates with a lot of people i mean because he is nebraska he is scott's bluff kid um very yeah, very close to wrestler. frost very close to frost though and i think probably pretty close to chenander mm -hmm. so yeah i that's one to really watch oh sean i i think people expect that now listen though i mean you think about this you lose oshaw mathis you lose maybe Garrett Nelson. You maybe lose Casey Thompson. You're losing Vokalek. Man, Palmer. I just named four. Palmer. Trey Palmer. That's five critical, critical players. I mean, the it's the best you got. And you counter that with five critical players from a team that won four games. Right. So is is there any player on this roster that is completely indispensable? I, no. I, I don't know if you can make that no. case with anybody. Those five are – now, O'Shawn didn't have a great year – but I mean, those are five grown. And how many men. of those guys those are, are five grown men? How I mean, many of those guys are one year rentals too? Yeah, yeah. Through the portal, Marcus Washington. You know, no, none of those are, are guys you can't go get in the portal right now, like in this cycle, especially if you have top level recruiters. Mm -hmm. So I'm that type of stuff. I'm not bending over backwards. Like if these guys come in and they're like, like, like Matt Rule said, if they're bought in and they show a full commitment to wanting to do things the way Matt Rule wants to do it, and they embrace everything that he's all about. Then yeah, absolutely. Then then we'll talk about it. But if this is some deal like, well, what am I going to get from NIL? What's my playing time going to be? How are you going to use me? If AJ Allen says on. that, I think I'd just listen and say, well, we'll take care of you. 
Well, okay. <laughs> There's still There's different. Yeah, but guys. what if Elijah Robinson comes on staff from Texas, Texas A&M, A&M. And this five-star running back that's going to go on the portal that he recruited? I still want AJ Allen on the roster. <laughs> okay, yeah. but there's not. But Rob, I mean, there's not many. I see what you're saying. There's not that's many. My, my overall point, not right. to single any specific no, no. guys out, but no. I mean, this is a team that has not won in a long right. time. None of those players are going to single-handedly change your program. No, they're and you're exactly right. I just I fixate on AJ Allen because I think he. I think I think AJ Allen could be really good. Yep. I'm watching that one. You know, I'm watching. And if I were rule, I'd I'd prioritize him. AJ Allen. O'Shawn Mathis. Am I, am I out of bounds on that? No. O'Shawn Mathis, people are saying was a bust. He wasn't, he had 30, Not a bust. He had 34 quarterback pressures on the year. He was excellent against um, Iowa. He had eight pressures in the Iowa game. Eight. Jeez. Um, hurries, sack hits, that, uh, and that, that equals a pressure. So he led Nebraska with 34, and I believe Garrett Nelson had 32. Okay. Um, so th- those were your two, and that's that's what they were supposed to do. Now, did they get sacks? A lot of that was Nebraska wasn't in a ton of third and longs to produce right. sacks. Right. Um, but yeah. did O'Shawn have the sack number we thought? No. Nope. But was he, he still – Would he have three and a half? Um, three and a half, I think, is what he ended up with. Now, no, he, but he was not. I, I think bust is too strong. I, it's disappointment. I mean, I think he played par golf. Like he, he didn't. Yeah, really, there you go. Make, the expectations were so high for him. Yeah. I mean, like people thought we were getting Von Miller, and you know, they got a guy that got three and a half sacks, yeah. which is fine. Yeah, but you know, par golf. Par yeah. Golf. Okay. Um, Spark Adventures has a super chat for us here. Thank you, Spark. Um, and get a little advertisement there if you got a company there. I don't know if that, that's your company, but this team has the talent now. I think um, Matt could potentially get us to a bowl game next year. I mean, I think if Nebraska went to a bowl game next year, there'd be 20,000 people that would go. Talent. Do they have – I mean, we just talked about it. I mean, you're taking the best offensive player off the off the, the portal. Sure. But that's the one guy that is officially gone. Everybody else is speculation. Yeah, but I think we can safely say, oh, Sean's leaving. Um, yeah. yeah, you're right, though. But we just talked about what him do you do being a par what do you, golfer. Yeah, what do you, what do, you do with Casey? Par. Is Casey – what what happened? That's Casey's, delicate because – Casey's comments today were interesting. What, what did he say? Well, I, well, I didn't okay. listen to them all. So he basically had a lot of praise for Matt Rule, and he's a guy that was clearly, as in typical Casey Thompson fashion, did a lot of research. Like, he was breaking down – Matt Rule's offense and the way that he runs that RPO and how physical really? they're off it. Like, I mean, it was like really? Casey. He's he's a he, he, uh, he does his research. He's a brainiac when it comes to football yeah. uh, and other things. But he uh, was a lot more complimentary and seemed to have that door a little further open okay. on a possible return than I, I personally thought. So if you haven't seen it yet, we have the video courtesy of our friends at KTV on our website right now Mm -hmm. um if you can go watch it and and see it for yourself on the youtube channel he he was one of the handful of players that he wasn't there i don't think for the actual press conference but they trickled in Mm -hmm. after the fact when some of the side podium interviews were going on he was one of the guys that was up on the perch just checking out the scene so Mm -hmm. if you're totally checked out and not coming back you know i don't know if you make that much effort to one show up two talk to reporters three have that much knowledge about your next coach and have those complimentary things to well, say. Well, think about Rule watching that game, which he did. He watched Rule watch the Iowa game. Well, what he saw from Casey Thompson. I mean, you, you at least have to be intrigued by that. Well, on Satter, Satterfield, Marcus Satterfield, the new offensive coordinator from South Carolina, you know, he's going to have a say in this too. Yeah, he will. Now, as far as Casey goes, now think about if the, if I'm Rule in Satterfield. And I'm looking at that picture of Casey as a 25 year old grown man who, let's face it, he looked pretty good this year, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, he wasn't perfect, but he didn't have a much of an offensive line to work yeah, with. He didn't so have a lot of help. Didn't have a lot of help. And he had some games. I mean, that, ga- that game at Purdue on the road was excellent. That game at Iowa on the road was excellent. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm a, I mean, I guess what I'm telling you is I'm a pretty big fan of Casey. I mean, and I think keep in Casey mind too, handled himself he was really hurt well. almost all year. Right. I mean, not just the elbow nerve thing mm-hmm. that sidelined him, but he said he had a partially torn labrum in his throwing shoulder against Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Played through that. I mean, he was getting well, he throws, busted up. On, I mean, there was there was legitimate concerns about his safety at some point yep. with how bad that offensive well, line was blocking. What I mean, my my thing though is like, what if you could get like a Cade McNamara to transfer here? He's going to yeah. Iowa. It sounds like. Ooh. Oh, I mean, that's Hello. just like a thought. Is that right? I mean, nothing official. That's the the. The, buzz. the rumor, 
Oh, hello. But NIL gets yeah. involved, guys, in that chain. Iowa does not have great NIL. No, Nebraska I mean, could swoop in on I mean, that. that if it becomes an, and you know, for Casey, it's a business decision for him. I mean, for him staying at Nebraska, it's a, probably a six figure deal. Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm, so you're, you're probably like, right. I mean, <laughs> if you make that kind of money, you want to keep making it, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. so then you ask yourself, is he an NFL quarterback? Uh, I don't think so. So he's already talked about his big plans for after football, building that training facility where he wants to open multiple locations and across several states. Uh, another year at Nebraska with a potential six-figure NIL deal will go a long way and help help funding that yeah. even further. Yeah. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of benefit to him coming back at a place like Nebraska where you are a marquee player. Uh, the opportunities with the surge in NIL at Nebraska has never been greater. Uh, yeah. <laughs> two collectives one of which is getting uh you know funded like crazy uh i just think there's a lot of pros for casey and it, it it would give reason why maybe he's cracked that door open a little bit more than initially did. doesn't this come down to who else they might have who satterfield else? yeah who who just sat i mean who does satterfield does he have somebody? I mean, it's possible that Rule and Satterfield <laughs> he already Spencer, have. Him. He had Spencer Rattler this year. I mean, yeah, Rattler I mean, can't go again, though. No, there he was a and Sean. He hopefully Rattler, nobody got duped by that tweet. Catfish. Yeah, there was a fake yeah. tweet that went around saying that he was considering Nebraska. Yeah, so. I got duped. Rat Rattler already transferred once. They're not changing coaching staffs yeah, in unless South he Carolina. graduated, right? And unless yeah. he graduated, or um, the coordinator change is a waiver. Ooh, I mean, okay, okay. All right. Well, watch it. We got to watch. It'd be that. funny though. Uh, another Oklahoma Sooner Tide guy. <laughs> you know, in that I'm not saying that's going to happen. No, let's um, not even speculate. Yeah, I mean, we're getting kind of off the rails on this thought. Yeah. But uh, if you're joining us right now, thank you. This is Husker Online. Uh, so, normally uh, our Monday night show, but we're reacting to the Matt Rule press conference. So, do we ever clarify our take, our stance on Garrett Nelson? It's something to watch. Yeah, something yeah. to watch. And. I think Garrett, you know, is the kind of guy that is going to put a lot of thought in this and 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 decide, you know, what's best. But you know, he's going to have to make it. This week will be big because the portal opens up a week from today. Now, next next week when we do our Husker Online Monday Night Rundown show, I mean, it's going to be just portal Bonkers. portal. I mean, mm -hmm. we, might, we might just be on all day. <laughs> well, we should avoid that scenario. Uh, but like yeah, Jerry Lewis telethon <laughs> right. for the portal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got this guy in. Yeah, musical yeah. acts. It'd be great. But yeah, we've got a a lot going on now with with everything. Just trying to figure all this out, and and you know the future of the step. I mean, besides Mickey Joseph, like, are we talking about anybody else? I mean, what about Bush? Bush? What about Sean Beckton? Bush is the guy that would be next. What would be next in what sense? That conversation of potential retention yeah. candidates. Yeah. I mean, as what well, I mean, how would you what job would you envision him in special teams coordinator okay. coordinator? Um, wow. I don't think he's going to be defensive coordinator. I think uh, Phil Snow seems like the most likely candidate there. Uh, yeah, Baylor, what about DC. Jeff Collins? Jeff Collins is another name Perhaps to keep in DC. mind. Now, Bill could coach safeties. I mean, that's his coach special teams. Yeah, he could coach special teams or safeties or whatever. He, I mean, he's his area special especially safe. And if they just hired a guy that's a cornerbacks coach, that would leave open a position that is not going to be a secondaries coach. There will be two defensive backs coach, which I think there maybe should he be. would. Be, I mean, they, I would think they maybe consider him now. You, he could also, he now I don't know do if that? this, I don't know if this happens all the time, how often it happens, but could he coach safeties and be the special teams coordinator? Kerry it, Coombs did that at yeah. Cincinnati. He would coach corners and was a, a lot of his corner. like what has rule cooked up. I mean, he just got to town today, but since Friday, he had Friday, Saturday, and Sunday back in his home base, wherever he was at. Where the hell that is? I don't know. That. Um, Charlotte or whatever the, the beach the place beach somewhere where, where they were. He was the beach probably, place. you know, I think it was almost by design. He wanted to get a lot of ducks in the row before he got in the building on Monday. Because can you imagine what it's like now for him? Oh. I, I I can imagine it because he was alluding to it today, and I and I was I was literally thinking as he was talking, how does he do this? I mean, there's there's so many moving parts that he's got. To so address. many people have an agenda or whatnot that want to talk to him. Yeah, he's talking about watching player film and how yeah, do you even have time to do that? How do you do that? Well, you know what? You know what time he's doing it? He's probably doing it all night. That's what yeah. he's doing. Well, he said after that press conference, he's taking that suit off, putting on his 
football gear and he's going to be in the office. So, I mean, like there's, there's no grace period here. He's ready to to hit the ball. Cause again, that window is very slim, short, whatever you want to call it to have this thing up and running. He wants to have his full staff in place by Friday, by Friday. Yeah. We'll see. (laughs) That's that's a lot to ask. That's a lot going on. All right. Well, um, continue to take comments. Uh, uh, people are laughing that you got duped. Um, I got duped by the, I got catfished. By the cat- <laughs> hey, is that the word? No. <laughs> Saturday, you've been pretty active in the chat. I got, <laughs> not, I got duped. You got catfished. <laughs> I got duped. Sorry, Sean. We, Level um, of sophistication I, needs I to want, improve. I know, Sean. I do um, want to. I, w- I want to hit on before we bring in Jim Rose to the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to hit on Matt Rule coming to Lincoln. Because oh yeah, it was before a, it was a um, a hot button topic in the underground. Oh, coming uh, to Lincoln to visit to visit um, for the Minnesota weekend. Yeah, we got to own up to this. And you know, I'm not like we we've had a lot of people come at us that we couldn't confirm it or acknowledge their report. It. And here's yeah. the deal: like that's what it came down to. You know, we have to use our real name when we report things. We can't just say like Husker Joe Smith told us this and we go i mean we have to i couldn't confirm we tried to there was no way to confirm it and in some ways it was probably for the best that that wasn't made public yeah i don't know what that would have done to the search if it would have gotten out that he was in town i'm genuinely surprised they pulled it off now they how did they he said matt rule said he was surprised no one found out about it how did they do people did find out about it it's a thing (laughs) some people did i mean now now they came in during a game in in what game are you saying minnesota Minnesota. game oh do you know that yes Okay, Minnesota game. So that was uh, what date was they, that? They drove him around town during the game. Yeah, so there'd be as few people that cared <laughs> as possible. Minnesota was November 5th. Okay, November. So, so clear back on November 5th. So let's put this time frame together. November 5th, they're playing Minnesota. And they so they were carting rule, the rules around town. Um, Julie was with, with Coach Rule. That's fa- fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. And we were covering the game. Um, we, All the diehard fans are probably at the game. There's a lot of people that wouldn't recognize Matt Rule. Yeah. Well, a lot of people that weren't at the game that were out and about not watching the game on TV. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, that's really smart to do it then yeah. uh, to avoid getting sniped. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so now I want to I, I, now I can put this together a little bit. November 5th. Now he said he was very impressed here but it was about november 15th when the sides parted ways again i mean well, and, and that that's been confirmed like it did yeah, look yes good. yeah he said it he did he loved it he liked it here and there he did say there was a there was a there was a period where he was like i love it but we just can't make this work yeah and it was a variety of factors it wasn't just nebraska it wasn't just him you know carolina had a big part in that with their willingness to cooperate with the buyout the way nebraska had hoped There's three parties in the negotiation yeah. and so when that didn't happen nebraska had to reevaluate what they were going to offer and so when it initially fell through matt said he got off the phone and he hung up and he was just like damn like right that's damn i want this job but, it, but and it's he, not going to happen right my that, wife is going to be ticked off my and, son's going to be mad like and you're right and then it, he got the call back. And I believe now what was happening, and you know, I was working a source on this, and I, I believe this was November. It was three days after the Michigan game. So it would have been, yeah, November 15th. It was about right at that time where I thought I was told, hey, rule wants the job, but they can't make it work. So heading into the that, Wisconsin weekend. That squares with what Matt said today. But we were told, and we reported it, that you know, they that ship may be a sailing and then, but I always would say you got to keep your eye on it. Cause it, cause it's fluid. Yeah. It's fluid and it might come back. And then and lo and behold, it came back. So that's, yeah, it was, but it was hey, Trev described the negotiations as long and arduous. Uh, well, and Trev, I think it was very tense. Think about this. Like Matt rule said, Trev's a hard guy to say no to. Like he gets very creative and mm-hmm. it reminds you of those stories about when Dean blaze, the great UNO hockey coach turned him down mm-hmm. multiple times, it was before, like four times right? before Trev Alberts was able to get Dean blaze who was a national championship, North Dakota hockey coach at one time to take the UNO job and it's got a little him. bigger though here. No, no. But like <laughs> in that, in that I get you though, you space know, right. that he was at. Sure. 
coach. That's a, a big job. It, it was a revenue sport at UNO. Yeah, it is. And he got, you're right, you know, a version of like Rick Patino mm -hmm. to take that job at UNO. It was a big deal. Trev is creative. Um, it, Trev was fascinating today. I was watching him during the, I'm going to tell you something, during that presentation, during Rule's presentation, Trev was watching it. I mean, you could tell he wanted Rule to hit a home run here. Yeah, I, I mean, I know you guys could say, oh, come on, it's not that big of a deal. It was big to Trev. I could tell by the look on his face. Oh, yeah. His his career is on the line here. I mean, the freaking governor was deal. sitting behind yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. The freaking governor was sitting behind him. Yeah. I mean, it was it was the magnitude of that situation was pretty even. OK, this is number six since Osborne. So you'd think it would lose some impact. But, man, it, it was a little muted, I thought. But still, it felt monumental. Think me. about, though, the state of Nebraska in row one, the football coach, the AD, row two, the governor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not the governor. Winds up about right. Yeah. I think the governor got involved in this a little bit, too, from what I was told. Um, he was governor, thanked. He was thanked by Trev Alberts. The governor. Yeah. The governor wants to go to governor's conferences and talk to governors who say, hey, you got a hell of a football program, as opposed to what the hell's wrong with your football program. I mean, it's a big deal to the governor. I think a lot of Nebraskans, like when I go on vacation and like I'll be in Florida, and you'll be in the pool, some guy from like Tennessee, and mm -hmm. he'll be like, what happened to y'all's football team? Right. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I think most Nebraskans watching our show, like when they go out of state and see relatives or go to Iowa and have people ask you questions, like you get tired of it. You get tired of it, but I'm amazed. Nebraska fans hang in there really well. Yeah, You get around the state, Sean, they hang in there. They're, they're hanging in there. Um, now, well, I mean, I liked what I heard today for what it's worth, for what it's worth. I liked what I heard. Yeah, again, good start. So they're showing a picture right now of the the big players here, Trev, Ted Carter, Matt Rule, Ronnie Green. I want to ask you about Ted Carter. Okay. I've, ask me. I get the sense that he was a critical piece in this. Oh, there's no doubt. Like when we're talking about that period when it looked like it was about to fall through. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just saw. I, just, I think yeah. Ted yeah. was a significant reason why that got back on track. Well, I know this. I was, yeah, you're, you're right. I'll just say it that way. No, you, I'm just gonna say you're right. I know when it was when it was seemingly falling apart that Ted got involved. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, he definitely helped it. And you, well, you could tell by what Rule said at the podium that where he singled out. Ted Carter. First guy. Yeah. Single First guy, thanks. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, Trev, I think the, the thought was like, Nebraska wouldn't spend this kind of money. Yeah. But, you know, there was no Hence Cyber Monday. Ted Carter or Black, stepping in. Our Black Friday pricing to get Matt Rule. I mean, it yeah, was nine mil. So he's going to nine million a year. 9.25. 9.25. And then seven million for the seven million for That's the huge for the for, his, for the assistance, Sean. And how's that compared to what Scott had? Scott had 5.15. 5.15 compared to seven. That's big um, time. That is. Now, I think there was some other money for like the other support staff mm -hmm. and they can get creative with that money too. So there, there's a lot more money than that. It's not just that money. I mean, there's uh, a big number. Yeah, I mean, there's a system pool. There's a lot of opportunity to, to fill the back end of that staff with, I mean, you have multiple six figure jobs that aren't coach jobs. Yeah. And you know, some people, Trev was asked if he'll if he if he fears blowback, and Trev said no, no, not, not it's at all. It's the big two, by the way. What what do you say? No, the no, SEC and the Big Ten, like right. And he he knows that you've got to have this kind of coach to win in this league. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you're chasing down. I mean, they're monsters. paying the going you're, rate right now for a yeah top coach. Yeah, you're paying the going rate, and you're chasing down monsters: Michigan, Ohio State, Penn State. Those are monsters. Nothing is cheap about Nebraska football. From the 102 people that buy skyboxes that spend 150,000 to 100,000 a year to the 165 million dollar football facility to, to all the ties, other people. Sean, to that's expensive. Uh. <laughs> but <laughs> nothing is cheap about no. Nebraska football. No. So you know you don't go to you can't go out and try to find a deal on a coach. I I totally agree with that. Uh, like and, no one else is being cheap. No, no they, they shouldn't go out. And, I mean, Wisconsin just hired. Now I don't. They paid less. I get all that. But they went and they went and got. Luke Fickle. I mean, look in your look in your immediate division who you're dealing with. Bielema, Fickle now, Brom. Um, I mean, this look, these guys are real. Yeah, you don't you're not going bargain basement in this league. Or you know you you know what? If you do, you'll just keep finishing. Yeah, finishing in the middle of the pack. Stay where you lucky, are if you're lucky.
Yeah. Now we got a question. Um, big super chat here for Brian Kelly. Thank Brian, you, Brian. C. Kelly. Brian, thank you very much. Um, but Brian wants to know why did the Panthers like what was the holdup? A lot of it is what was the holdup. What do you mean? The money holdup. Yeah, as far as the what contractual issues with his buyout. And we had a user break this down, and I, I can't. It's on our message board, but uh, and he said this is my best way to like break down kind of the numbers for Nebraska, but. You know, Carolina in year one will play four and a half million, year two, three and a half, year three, two and a half year. Okay. So Carolina is essentially this user broke it down that Carolina is on the hook for 12 million is still. Yeah. And if you look at the way that his yearly payouts are structured, there's like a you could just draw a line and say this is when the buyout ends because it's going from like uh, you got broken down there. But like basically, I think in 2026, it jumps like up in like the 10, 12 million dollar. OK range where it starts off pretty low so you can see how that factored in and that was the hold up was carolina's willingness to work their buyout with nebraska's new contract so i think part of one of the holdups was nebraska was thinking that carolina was going to offset a lot of their upfront cost and when carolina wasn't cooperating you know nebraska wasn't prepared to take that much bigger of a commitment and then that's where i think ted carter got involved they were able to open up the checkbook a little bit more yeah. and they got the deal done. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fairly complex in that regard. And that's why it was, Hey, that's why while it was ongoing, it would be virtually impossible to report that. Do you understand? Cause I mean, it's too high level. Yeah. It's too, it's too complex well, and it'd be too hard to convey. That's my, that's where I stand on. So essentially when you add Carolina money into what Nebraska's paying, him, he's going to be making, 10 million per year the first four years you know like the carolina <laughs> money brings it to 10 so he's 10 million every year okay. and then in year five he's 10 million then it's 11 and a half then it's 12 then it's 12 and a half mm -hmm. he's well compensated yeah he's <laughs> that's why his wife's smiling <laughs> here's a here's a notable thing that I just popped along twitter thomas vadoni tweeted a picture of himself watching an old temple football game Matt Rule used to coach at Temple. Yeah, Fedoni. That's a lot one. of questions about him. Yeah, interesting. Seems like he's doing his research as well. Yeah, Fedoni would be a bit. Hey, man, if you're if you're Rule, that's the kind of guy you're going to pretty quickly, I would think. I mean, aren't you prioritizing certain guys like AJ Allen and Fedoni? I mean, those are the guys. Hausman, Nelson, Hausman, Hausman. Yeah, I mean, to an extent, the the oh, corner, that, that little um, corner hard song, yeah. Well, guys, um, well, let's face it, Newsom. I mean, there's a lot of guys you want to get to here. They're not that bad. I mean, that should be a bull team. That should have been a bull team. This Absolutely. Year. It should have been a bull Zero team. question. Yeah. Jim is Jim Rose is in the green room. So we, oh, we get him. Let's get Jimmy in the room. All right. Here. Hey, well, me and me and Rob. Say hi to Rosie. Off. You guys say hi to Rosie. 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 Hey, doing, fellas. Nice to talk to you. You you just spent the last 10 minutes blowing through all my show prep. So I'm going to go back to, you know, binge watching Yellowstone. If you're you, can say it all, idea. you can say it all much more eloquently than me. <laughs> yeah, right. We've yeah, morphed not. our post-game show into the Monday Night Rundown, Jim, so we appreciate you uh, coming on and, and joining us here. Sure, glad to be here. Uh, a couple of things, guys, um, and you pretty much had it right with regard to Carolina and the holdup. Uh, it really boiled down to what can Nebraska do and what can Carolina do collectively to be okay and uh, as you guys pointed up a minute ago, all you have to do is look at the trend of what Matt Rule will be paid here. And that coincides directly with the payout that Carolina owes them. Uh, coaches have gotten and athletic directors have gotten a lot more sophisticated since the Bo Pelini days when Bo basically worked for minimum wage at Youngstown State just to squeeze Nebraska for the last dime of his guarantee. And you can't do that anymore. Now it has to be market. The, the coach has to demonstrate that he's out there looking for a job and they have to adhere to market rates so that you can't work for $10 an hour until your buyout and then you go to $5 million a year. Uh, and I'm sure this was probably at the heart of what interrupted the Matt Rule uh, conversation back on the 5th of November. I'm not surprised that very few people saw him because as you pointed up all the reporters were at the game and all the people who cared were either watching it or at the game. So he could have walked down O Street buck naked and very few people <laughs> oh, would have know known that it was Matt Rule. Uh, it, it, that's just the nature of, of what happens on game days around here. Most people, anybody who cares about college football or Nebraska were either watching the Minnesota game, listening to the Minnesota game, 
or in person at the Minnesota game or covering the Minnesota game. So it was very wise of them to drive around Lincoln in the middle of the afternoon on November 5. It was. Good move by Trev. Trev handled this. I don't, I mean, I don't want to, I'm not carrying Trev's water. Sure you are, Sip. Come on. I do that, right? <laughs> I, I am that guy. Um, but he handled this very well. Yeah. Orderly. Yeah. Very orderly. I'm well, very, he, very impressed. He, he's a professional. And I pointed this up on KFAB this afternoon. For the first time in a long time, we have administrators who have two things, one, self-discipline, and two, a full understanding of what their lane is. We've had way too many administrators around here and athletic directors doing things they didn't have the skills to do, making decisions they were not qualified to make, uh, interfering in sports activities way, way above their capacity. And we finally have some administrators, specifically an athletic director and a president, Ted Carter, who knows exactly what his role should be. And Jim Pillen being involved in this decision is, is very appropriate to me. He's a member of the Board of Regents. Uh, and the Board of Regents have to approve this contract. So for him to be involved, at least in the latter stages, makes all the sense in the world. Now, I visited with a regent during the Wisconsin game uh, and specifically asked him, and it wasn't Jim, specifically asked him, what's the role here? And he says, finally, we're not you know, interfering in football. Uh, we will be kept apprised, and when we have to approve the agreement, per state statute, we will. But this is Trev Albert's job. This is why he's getting paid over a million dollars a year. Now, in the situation with Ted Carter, number one, he's a really bright guy. Uh, he's a top gun fighter pilot, and he's once parked a, a an aircraft carrier. So I don't know if any of you guys have ever parked an aircraft carrier, but it takes a little bit of skill. You kind of need to know how to read stuff. So this guy got involved when it was pretty clear that once you make an offer, this is when you lose control of the process. And Trev knows it. Ted Carter knows it. Chris McIntosh knew it. Once you make that offer, you lose control because now you can't control the agent, you can't control other schools, and you can't control your guy. So they were worried. And some Nebraska fans that I've been watching it on social media all afternoon are going, what cost is $3 million extra dollars? Does that guy know what the hell he's doing? Yeah. Because let's say you say, hey, we're not going to play that game. And then it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday and you don't have a coach. Mm -hmm. And then you got to go to plan B. Yeah. That's when Ted Carter said, it's worth the $3 million, Trev. Make the deal if this is the guy you want. Yeah. And I believe that there were probably three or four guys on the top line. And any one of those three could have gotten this job and been just as, uh, I think, satisfying to Nebraska's athletic administration and central administration as Matt Rule. And there was probably an occasion in there, Sip, uh, when maybe Lance Leipold got a visit, you know, when there was a gap between the Matt Rule negotiations. Because yep. Trev's thinking, this may not work out. Good okay? point. This and that's probably gap. when Trev says, okay, well, this is the guy I want, but I, I can't be left with one guy. We've had athletic directors in the past be in that boat. It's gotcha. embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, so this thing was handled great. And I'm really thrilled about Matt Rule. I, I don't know if he's going to work out. We don't know if he's going to work out. It might be a disaster, but the key is to minimize the risk, run your metrics, run your process, and minimize the chances of a failure. And that's what Trev Alberts and Ted Carter have done here. I'm glad you mentioned Lance. What the scenario you laid out is, it really makes sense. There, there was they were in negotiations with Rule. It didn't, you know, they were it didn't look necessarily good at that point when they talked to Lance. It was, you know, they talked to Lance on November 13th. So it was a Sunday after the Michigan game. And at that point, he probably didn't know what was going to happen with Rule. Trev didn't know what was going to happen with Rule. Lance, you notice, did not get an offer. And that's that's probably why, because 1A, they were still negotiating with. Mm -hmm. Lance was a guy they could go to. I believe, Jimmy, that Doran, Dave Doran at North Carolina State was that too. I think what I was told from someone in the industry was it's it's rule Leipold and Dorn. And it jives with with what I was told from Lance's camp, which is he's got a he's got a he's got a one in three chance at this job. Mm -hmm. So that's what I think was going on. I think you characterized it very well. I think that's absolutely right. And I think that early in the game Bill O'Brien was a very strong candidate, but it became clear 
uh, I think to Trev and to, to Nick Saban, that Bill probably wants to go back into the NFL. And you don't want to fight that battle. Uh, there is considerable speculation, and I think it's reasonable, that he'll be back with the New England Patriots. He'll be calling plays for them next year because they're 26th in the league in offense this year. Okay. And he will be the heir apparent to Bill Belichick. Uh, and I think Bill O'Brien, if he had truly wanted to, to be back in college football, could have been a very strong candidate for this and might have been on that line with Doran and Lance Leipold. And Matt Rule. And I think Luke Fickle, too. But Fickle might have been, and I don't know, uh, maybe he was zeroed in on just Wisconsin if Wisconsin started making overtures. But um, Trev and Ted did not want to wait another day and, like I said, get to 430 on Sunday afternoon and not have your guy, Mm -hmm. especially since Arizona State was going to pull the trigger. Colorado's probably pretty close. Auburn... uh, it, it, you know, I can see why Matt Rule probably turned down Auburn. I think that was the other school. I'd, I'd bet money on that. And mm-hmm. it's because he didn't want to call five boosters every Monday and see what his job status was, which is how it works down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Hugh Freeze is fine with it, and they're paying him a fortune, and he was successful at Ole Miss when he wasn't cheating, or maybe he was successful at Ole Miss when he was cheating. <laughs> but that's the SEC, and Matt Rule is not an SEC guy. He's a Big Ten guy. He grew up, his ears were filled every Saturday with the sounds of Big Ten football from Beaver Stadium. He knows this league. He appreciates this league. And some of the things he had to say today were just eagle music in my ears. He talked about, we want Nebraska men here. We don't want Nebraska recruits. We want guys who want to be Nebraska men. Mm -hmm. Uh, We will, we will create an atmosphere where guys want to be here. Mm -hmm. And he made a very important point about NIL and the transfer portal. The top programs don't have to worry about the transfer portal or the NIL program because the guys there are there to win a championship, play for their teammates. Sure, they're going to get compensated if they're good. But this is not what this program is going to hinge on. Uh, And we did get some good NIL transfers this year. Yeah, Casey Thompson had a good season. Didn't have a great season. He had a good season. He doesn't have an NFL arm, but he had an NFL receiver to throw to. And the only school that had DBs that could cover a man-to-man was Illinois. Uh, That's pretty good. You're playing 12 games, only one game against a team that's got man-to-man bump and run cover guys. Well, he's going to see that every day in the NFL. But, yeah, uh, he had a good – I thought he – Grant had a – Grant could have been a really sterling back for Nebraska this year, in my view, if – the offense had spent a little more time putting the ball in his hands. Oh yeah. Now hold on. I mean, you got to have an offensive line, Jimmy. They could have sure. run block. I mean, they but, you, but they could have gotten him the ball more in space. Sip. I think they could have yeah. created a package to put him on the edge, get him. We very rarely saw a bubble screen out of this team this year. Uh, and that doesn't take a lot of offensive line play, but you do have to have receivers that block on the edge. I, I, I hate to second guess coach. Cause you know, there's the easiest thing in the world to do is second guess plays that didn't work. Uh, but I can tell you that um, this is a great day because I really believe this is the dude. I, th- I think this is the dude, but it better be because starting in 2024, this conference is on Rodeo Road. And if you're not shopping on Rodeo Road, you're going to get your ass kicked. I mean, that's why Wisconsin hired Luke Fickle, because they know that. And there are a lot of nervous people in Iowa City, Evanston, West Lafayette right now. We've got some breaking news um, on the staff front. Bruce Feldman um, just reported Ed Foley um, will be joining the staff. Um, He was an assistant special teams coach for the Carolina Panthers. Uh, He was one of the 10 guys, Sip, that I featured in our our Sunday, um, our um, staff feature on Saturday that ran. Mm -hmm. Um, So here's the breakdown on Ed Foley, who will be on the staff. Uh, When Matt Rule left Temple for Baylor in 2016, Ed Foley was the interim head coach at Temple. He also served as the Owls' interim head coach when Jeff Collins left Temple for Georgia Tech in 2018. He was at Temple from 08 to 2018, so he was there for 11 seasons. And in 2019, he rejoined Rule at Baylor as an offensive analyst, and he followed him to Carolina as an assistant special teams coach. So my question is – What's he going to coach? Is he he a position coach or going to be more in one of those senior analyst roles? Okay. We don't know. Feldman doesn't say. And what – What does Feldman say? Working with special teams. Yeah. So, so I bet he's the special teams coordinator. At least that's analyst. probably his area. Second. Now, wait a second. Um, is he an analyst or is he a coordinator? 
I, I see him as probably – I'm just going to guess, but more of an analyst. based see, on Jimmy's saying coordinator. Maybe to start, and then we'll see. I think I think what Rule wants are guys around him he can trust. He was an uh, assistant special teams coach in the yeah. NFL, okay. um, and he was an analyst at Baylor. So he has okay. not been on the field as a full-time positional coach since 2018. So this might be an analyst. This might be an older guy that moves into – I mean, because those analyst jobs can pay 200000 Sure. It's and, not like they're GAs yeah. speaking in church basements for 50 bucks. <laughs> You mean like we still do? Um, we, we have to do, yeah. But we got. Couple, I think I think that's spot on, Sean. And what you're seeing now is a trend, which I, I think was wholly predictable, and that is that Matt Rule is going to surround himself with people that have been in the foxhole with him. Uh, and I know to to the Nebraska fan, you know, why don't you hire Mickey? Why don't you hire Bill Bush? Why don't you hire so and so, Sean Becton? You know, they're great coaches, aren't they? Yeah, they are. But this is a this is a very serious deal to this head coach and this athletic director. And this head coach has to truly believe that everybody in his meeting room is somebody that A, has proven to him that he can do the job and B, is loyal to him. This is really, really important, especially in the early stages of a program where kids, if things don't go exactly the way they're supposed to do, they're gonna have a little wobbly feet, you know? They're gonna go, well, maybe this isn't gonna work and would have been really great if Mickey had gotten the job, Mm -hmm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, But if I can say something about Mickey and Bill Bush, First of all, I don't think we can appreciate what Mickey Joseph did in this program enough. I mean, this thing was was a, a, a SHT show when he took over. And this thing could have gone off the cliff and players could have really left, you know, just lost their marbles and lost all of their poise on and off the field. I thought Mickey did a spectacular job in that facet of, of managing this program under very difficult circumstances. And I know a lot of Nebraska fans want him to stay. I'm thinking if Mickey wants to be a head coach, and he and I haven't talked about it, so you guys probably know better than I because you visited with him more than I have. He needs to go now and find a mid-major job, yeah. leverage the, the affinity that the industry has for him, you know, call his friends, mm-hmm. call all of the people that, that are important that have been a part of his program, get that head coach job, brandish your credentials. You're not going to get a head coach job if you're a coordinator from Nebraska, especially if it's in title only, because he's going to bring in his own offensive and defensive coordinators. So if Mickey wants to stay here, great, you know, make him a ball coach, a position coach. He's going to do a great job in recruiting. But if I'm Mickey Joseph and I want to be a head coach and I, I think every assistant, most every assistant wants at some point to be a head coach, man, go for it now. Get that Tulsa job or get a job like that. He's 54 years old and it's, it's time. Yeah, especially since he's never been a coordinator. Right. Uh, he, you know, you just don't – Tony Samuel was able to get a D1 job not having been a coordinator, but that was after Nebraska had won a national title. Tony Sam is a great guy, great coach, but he had to take the worst D1 job in the country at New Mexico State. And he was actually kind of competitive for a while, but it shows you how hard it is. Mm-hmm. And in this case, if he's able to go to Tulsa, and I'm just throwing that out there, I don't know if Tulsa's hiring him. Tulsa's open. It's, it's number one, it's in a manageable conference. Number two, it's, it's in a metropolitan area. Oklahoma has excellent high school football. He has access to the JUCOs in Kansas, Texas, and Oklahoma. And he can, he can learn the, the job. And I, I think he'll do great there if it's at a position like that, uh, mm-hmm. where he is not overwhelmed by competition. Hey, Rosie, I got to jump in with some uh, people pay money. It's called Super Chat. Oh, yes, yes. You know, we've got some Super Chats I want to get to. Um, first one is from super duper Steve. Um, what's rules rep as a recruiter hands on, or does he delegate the bulk to his assistant coaches and focus on current players? Like he's mentioned at the press conference, I think that's a great question until we know the makeup of the staff and how it's going to be. But I see Matt rule as a very big living room guy. I think he's gonna be very organized, uh, with his appearances. Uh, but there's no doubt from what we saw today, Jim, he's going to be great in the living room. I think he's a closer. I think he's what a head coach is supposed to be. Uh, I think what you're going to see in this program is something we haven't seen since Bob Devaney was the head coach here, and that is a CEO at the top of the food chain with outstanding assistants that that handle the bulk of the early recruiting process, that are very active in weekly game planning, that run practices, 
and Rule will oversee this, and he will oversee the whole program. This is what Trev Alberts wants. I don't know how many times Trev mentioned this, and Matt mentioned it today, strategy. I'm a strategic thinker. He's not a ball coach. Bo Pelini was a ball coach, okay? Tom Osborne was a ball coach. He was just such a genius. He could handle the job. Uh, certainly, uh, Scott Frost, in his best element, was a ball coach. But this guy is a CEO, and he will come in and close recruits. One of the challenges with Frank, and Sip, you remember this, Frank used to open the recruiting process, which meant who was left to close? You know, Ron Brown? Uh, it was all messed up because his assistants weren't working hard for him. So he had to do all the work in recruiting in a perfect situation. The head coach closes on the elite prospects and the assistants do all the other work. We'll see if that's what rule does. That's very possible. All right. Speaking of recruiting, another staff question, Elijah Robinson from Texas A&M defensive line coach. That's been with Matt rule before. Um, he's the third highest paid defensive line coach in the country for Jimbo Fisher. Uh, makes in the 800,000s as a non-coordinator, um, rumored to be on the staff. What are the chances of him coming? And the smoke there is he recently liked two different tweets involving Nebraska and Nebraska recruits. Elijah Robinson? Elijah Robinson okay. um, voted as – Hope you're sorry. The 2022 National Recruiter of the Year. Well, okay. But, can he, but he, can he develop players? Can he take a guy – can he take this – and make it into an offensive lineman. Milt Teneper used to be able to do that, okay? There's this is cr this is really important, and I don't think we can underestimate this. In this era where we're trying to build the program back to where it was, you've got to make the core of your football team the developmental player. Uh, that doesn't mean that you take <laughs> just anybody, but I just firmly believe to meet the strategic goals that this coach has and this athletic director has, you got to have coaches who can, yes, attract great talent, but you've got to have a lot of coaches that can turn that into something too. Uh, and if we, if we don't get that, we're going to have trouble. We're going to have trouble getting guys to stay and we're going to have trouble getting guys to mesh. So yeah. I think he's, I think he's a great recruiter, but can he turn guys into linemen that will think, win yeah. the ball, win the battle at the line of scrimmage? I think it's important by, I mean, I'm, I, I always emphasize Jimmy that you got to get, all, all Americans in here too. I mean, bona fide. I mean, guys that are coming in looking like all Americans. Not everybody can be a developmental project. I mean, you got to have some guys that are no brainers, Jimmy. I mean, I mean, this is a nice little story going on at Iowa. It's nice, but they don't win Big Ten championships. No, and I think the problem at Iowa was not necessarily that sip as much as that coach is so stubborn. And that, that program is cultured in such a way they don't want to risk losing an elite prospect. So they just go for the, the low-hanging fruit, and they just live with a mediocre high school-level offense. How is it possible that the University of Iowa can't have a Division I quarterback on its roster? Yeah. It didn't this year. I mean, Because I they, didn't, they can't recruit it because now people say, I go there, I'm going to throw 10-yard drag routes. I'm going to hand the ball off 65 70% of the time there's just, there's no lure there. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if, if he'd gone after Max Duggan and said, Max, we are going to build our offense around you. Mm -hmm. He'd have gotten them. Okay. There, he was never going to go after Max Duggan. Why? He didn't want to lose Max, Max Duggan. Oh, okay. Now, well, I think. I just, world, I'm just world saying, according to Rosie. I'm just saying healthy mix. You, sure. You, you, definitely developmental players are critical and especially at a place like Nebraska. Oh, you so better bring in some guys that are very identifiable as potential all Big Ten, all American type players. No question, Sip. For every Terry Keneally, you gotta have a Grant Wistrom. Okay. Yeah. For every John Hess, you gotta have a Terrell Farley. Yeah. You know, That's for every thank you. um, and I'm gonna miss somebody here. You, you, I'm on green. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm on green. Yeah. You, you got to have Mike Brown's out there, okay? You got to have a Ralph Brown. You got to have a Frazier. You got to have a Phillips. Yeah. No question. For every Matt Hoskinson, you got to have Will Shields, right. you know, uh, or, or whomever. Uh, and for sure. And uh, you're not going to – you're not going to win championships without him. No. But I just – I love what, what Coach Rule wants to do with this program, what his vision of how we're going to be successful. Because that's how he made the field. He made the field by outworking everybody. He was a walk-on for Pete's sake, right. he, and he uh, he played on great teams. Penn State, eventually. I mean, Go he ahead. was he was always looked at as a guy that could be Penn State's head coach. I mean, when oh, he yeah. went in there with Temple and beat Ooh. Penn State, beat him. 
They oh, wanted him that afternoon. Would that would that have been Bill O'Brien? Bill O'Brien's first? first year. Yeah, that was that was Bill O'Brien's first. But year. a lot Super of people are like, this guy could be Penn State's head coach. Sure. I, he just did miracles at Temple. Temple's a horrible, horrible place to try and build a football program. It's a pro sports town. You know, it's a very elite, you know, private institution. Uh, he, he people forget a couple things. They forget that that Matt Rule went to Baylor and they had forty five scholarship players on the roster the day he took the job. They had one they had one commit in their signing class in their recruiting class in the Big Twelve with Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, TCU. And this was a really really tough job, and he did a great job, and he built. Texas recruiting ties. Yep. Uh, Luke Fickle took over a hell of a lot better program at Cincinnati from Tommy Tuberville and from um, Brian Kelly and mm-hmm. from Butch Jones. They, those guys, Butch they, Jones. They, they, Butch Jones, and those guys had players in the program. They were in the AAC. Mm-hmm. They were sitting in an excellent place to recruit the second tier player after Big Ten schools got done with them. So, and Fickle did a great job at, at Cincinnati to get into the playoffs is miraculous for a for a group, group of five. five. Yeah. But I got to tell you, Matt Rule has taken on much more challenging jobs, uh, I believe. And I'm not just saying that because he's the Nebraska coach now. I'd say that even if he went to Wisconsin and Nebraska got Luke Fickle. But I really believe that, that what he did at Baylor under those conditions were, was really miraculous in the Big 12. I agree, Jimmy. Got another super, uh, chat? Super, super chat question. It says, um, what do you think of the Georgia defensive coordinator rumors? I, I guess I don't know what the rumors are. I mean, are there is there smoke about a Georgia coach joining the there's staff? There's smoke. Uh, I haven't – I have not seen anything to suggest there's much significance to the smoke. I mean, they're playing in the SEC title game in the playoff. I just – yeah, we've yeah. been wrong before, though. So, uh, yeah, we've, yeah. <laughs> hey, I thought you guys did a really good job, actually. Uh, I mean, the, the coverage of this event was measured. And, Sean, you said it right. We have to put our names on this. Okay. I go on 50,000 watts every freaking morning. You do. If I start throwing a bunch of rumors out there. People are going to laugh at KFAB, and that station's been around 100 years. It's going to be around a lot longer than after I'm gone. But, you know, we could say it's going to be this guy. It's going to be that guy. It's going to be with, you got to have a sense of responsibility for this. Mm-hmm. And I thought through the course of the last month and a half, we were speculating with intelligence, not just from the seat of our pants, because mm-hmm. you do have to put your name on this. And the people who subscribe to your information, you give them enough bad information, they'll stop subscribing. So uh, it was well done. Thank uh, you. I, I thought it was a very well done piece of, of journalism. Thank you. Uh, and I, I mean that sincerely, but I, I truly, I truly believe this, that, the Big Ten Conference is at a crossroads. Why you Unless, I, I, guys, there's a reason why, why Wisconsin, Wisconsin's facilities resemble a 1960s East European Olympic village. <laughs> <laughs> okay? I mean, they're bad. They're bad when the sun shines. Okay? But when the sun doesn't shine, you, you got to look away. Uh, they know it. Luke Fickle knows it. Chris McIntosh knows it. You're going to see new facilities pop up in Madison very quickly. They serve our, I'm not joking. They serve RC Cola in their stadium. <laughs> like, and they mix I'm that with kidding. other stuff. I'm not kidding. Like yeah. when, I, when I went there for the first time in the several trips yeah. we've been there, like, you know, it's Pepsi Coke. They had RC yeah. Cola. Yeah. Like, it's it's brutal. Deal with RC Cola. <laughs> they just, but Chris McIntosh, this is, you know, he's at the beginning or kind of in the middle of his career. He's not going to, he's not going to be last in the big 10. And if you're not in, in the big 10, starting in 2024, you're out. Mm-hmm. And we know that USC, UCLA, Ohio state, Michigan, and Penn state are in. Yeah. So there's five. Yep. Nebraska is in yep. six. Mm-hmm. Wisconsin is now in mm-hmm. seven. Mm-hmm. What about the rest of these people? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I got to tell you, if you are in Iowa city, you got to make a sober decision about the future of your program very, very soon because it will not be successful after 2023 when the divisions go away. Same thing in Evanston. Pat Fitzgerald has been kind of percolating along. They will give you three quarters and lose the game. They, they will not go better than 1-11 and 11 unless they can get some sort of admissions waiver because 90% of the top 300 players – on everybody's recruiting board are disqualified from Northwestern because of their entrance requirements. They, they can't compete. And Stanford's in the same place. These people are not going to compete in the new college football. 
unless they change. And if you're PJ Fleck, you have glistening facilities. Uh-huh. You're in the second largest market in the Big Ten, home market in the Big Ten. But PJ needs to row that boat up to those Fortune 500 companies and get some NIL cash. And then he needs to paddle over to the admissions office and get 10 academic waivers for JUCOs or transfers. Because U of M doesn't take JUCOs because they, they don't qualify academically. Mm-hmm. You won't be successful. Mm-hmm. Illinois, I believe, is in. If they keep him there. You are in. They're in. They're going to be tough to beat. But Purdue's got a problem. Uh, Indiana is, uh, you know, you never say never because of what happened at Kansas State. Keeping him. I mean, Indiana is just not going to be competitive in the new Big Ten with Northwestern and Rutgers. But at least Rutgers and Maryland have a recruiting footprint in that area. Uh, Rutgers, there are players close by and there are players close to Maryland. Um, But I got to tell you. It's going to be hard unless you're all in with great coaches, great facilities, and operations. And right and, now, and, seven of them are in and seven aren't. And you better have your admin, top-level administration in. And, and, you know, Rule, Rule emphasized that today. I mean, there's a lot. it's a big reason he's here because he feels like he uses the word alignment. Jimmy, we've been talking about that for many years here. Yeah. And Nebraska, for a long time, did not have alignment. They didn't have alignment in the latter part of Frank's no. tenure when Steve came in in 2002, they did not have alignment when, when they had the Pelini, I course Perlman years, there was no alignment no. and it, it hurt them. And so that's, I mean, if you're a Nebraska fan, it guarantees nothing, but it, but it definitely helps. Well, and, 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 it, and it helped get rule here. Yeah. And Sip, all you have to do is go back to Clifford Harden to know how important it is to have a great chancellor. Three guys were offered the job before Clifford Harden stepped into Tippy Dye's office in 1961 and said, I don't like any of these people. Mm-hmm. Then none of them will work here. Mm-hmm. Okay. And one of them was John Ralston, who went to Stanford, actually had a pretty good career. But mm-hmm. he said, I'm taking over this search now, Tippy. You worry about basketball. And he went and called Duffy Doherty, who said, hire the guy at Wyoming. So all you have to do is go back through to 1961 to know how important the chancellor is here. And Tom Osborne often said that Ron Roskins, the late Ron Roskins, he could trust Ron Roskins because Ron Roskins knew how important sports was to Nebraskans and how big of a brand that was globally for our university. So he was very supportive of Coach Osborne when he was president of the university. But when we started getting these mediocre presidents and, and very poor chancellors, and we know who they are, That's when this program went off the cliff. And part of it was these people didn't know what lane to stay out of. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I can promise you this, and I'm a big fan of Bill Burns. If Harvey Perlman had stayed in his lane in January of 2003 and said, Bill, you're not going anywhere. You've turned this athletic program around. I don't care what A&M is offering you. You're staying. I'll give you $100 more a week than they're offering Mm -hmm. or whatever it's going to take. Mm-hmm. If that happens, I am convinced we don't have the problems that we've had the last 22 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've got to have the right people at the top of the food chain. Nobody trusted Steve. Nobody trusted Sean Eichhorst. Coach Osborne really didn't want the job as AD. He wanted to be around football and protect his football program. But he didn't have a strategic plan for athletics like you've got to have. Did a great job getting us into the Big Ten. But you got to have that. And I believe with with – Admiral Carter and with Dr. Gold, they have that at Nebraska. I got a lot of comments. Why is Robin so disengaged? Well, someone's got to yeah. someone's got to run the cast register in the store right now. <laughs> and news happening. And thank you, Robin. Um, just posted on Husker Online, and Trey, you can pull this up. Uh, break down what just what we, we hit on it earlier, but what what he been working on. Uh, and Robin did not eat too many chicken wings up here. He's he's no. he's working away here on the computer. I wish. No, yeah, just posting the Ed Foley to join Nebraska's coaching staff story. Um, you know, you look back. Spent a lot of time uh, both at Temple, at Baylor, and then at Carolina with Matt Rule. So that familiarity is clearly there. Um, he worked as a assistant head coach, special teams coordinator, tight ends coach, um, kind of jack of all trades under Rule's staff. So you could see how that's a a trusted um, just resource for Matt Rule. And 
what we don't know is what his title will be at Nebraska. It could be a number of different things. It could be an analyst position. Uh, we, we yet to find that out, but um, you're starting to see the the wheels continuing to move very quickly with Matt Rule assembling this coaching staff. All right, and getting uh, another super chat comment here I want to bring in as we kind of wrap up tonight's show. Brian C. Kelly again with a $20 super chat. Thank you. Um, hearing you guys talk, by the way, we're not going to ask, remember the gun to your head question last week? Was it uh, uh, name your coach in, in your, the state of Kansas comment? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, that might have been 100 bucks. So somebody put a lot of money to get you. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a big bounty. Not far off. So, um, no, you were close. Yeah. Uh, but, Hearing you guys talk for the last hour plus, this feels so perfect. What are the warning signs that the other shoe is going to drop? What do you look for? And I guess I the other shoe is going to drop, meaning? Uh, yeah, I, I'm kind of having a hard time following you there, Brian. If you want to hit us back with another comment, um, let us know what you mean by like that. Like why this isn't going to work? Oh, why it might not work? When is the other shoe going to drop in that regard? Does he think this will? That there's some bad thing that's going to happen in the program here soon? Is that what is he's I don't implying? know anything along those lines, Jim. I, 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 this is a, this this program is in such good hands right now. I, I don't really know what he's what he's referring no. to. You you have a strong athletic director. You have an outstanding chief financial officer in the athletic department. You have an incredibly supportive president of the university and a great provost. I, I I'd like to know what he means. Maybe yeah. he just means that it feels so good that that this can't. <laughs> I don't I think we're conditioned that way a little bit here. I mean this is a I mean we the fan base has been I don't like to say the words beaten down, but there's a lot that's gone wrong. I I just try to stay optimistic. This is this is a you know a, the proverbial new beginning, but listen, what I see and what I like is energy. And I think the program has lacked that sort of energy for a long time and it's not going to lack it now it lacked it under riley to a large degree he had that feel of a i'm i'm, I'm i can't believe i'm here it was that sort of energy frost i think there was a ton of energy when he came lost his first six covid hit scott i think i mean garrett nelson said it best in indianapolis I just want to see Scott have fun again. Scott wasn't having fun. The energy wasn't good. Now, now there's this this rejuvenation and this energy that is bad that was badly needed. So I think that that's where I start the, with the the pressure of the state and just being the savior. I think that it ended up getting to Scott. It wore him down. I mean, just Sean. I think you're right. All the players. I did find it. What you think of just the people in attendance today? I mean, a lot of former players were there. But, Jim, I want your thoughts on this. It was a lot more 70s and 80s guys. I mean, it wasn't a big 90s crowd there today. Um, some 90s guys. Uh, Jay Foreman was there. Um, trying to think who else uh, I saw in, in the room today. 90s. Is that um, Warren, Steve Warren? Steve Warren was there yeah. from the 90s. Uh, but Guy David Ingalls was there. Was there. Um, Trainowitz was, was there. Trainowitz was there. He's 80s, yeah. Um, there was probably and, a little bit more of a mix than might have appeared. Uh but there were uh, over 100 players that sat with Scott Frost before he had his news conference four years ago um, or however long ago it was, five years ago. I can't remember now. They all run together for me. Um, but, you know, I, I truly believe that Nebraskans have such an emotional investment in this because this is what makes us matter. Uh, college football and, and success on this stage um, is tremendously important to Nebraskans. We take a great deal of personal pride in this because it's a tough game and we're tough people. Uh, you know, only tough guys are successful to football. Well, only tough people could have made this into a livable place 150 years ago. Uh, we, we, we've got, you know, convenience stores on the corner. This was one god-awful place to live back in the mid-19th century. Mm -hmm. But it took people that were saying, no, this is my place. We're going to turn this into something. Well, football is a lot like that. You know, it takes grit and toughness and and, and it takes commitment. And so that's why we love this game. At least that's how I think Nebraskans in their origins uh, used to behave and, and, and believed greatly to this day. Uh, but they want somebody who, who understands how much it matters. I think Scott Frost was overwhelmed. I, I, think, I, I, th I think he realized I'm not a head coach. I don't have the organizational skills. I'm not a strategic thinker. I know the game, 
But when he showed up and saw the daunting task before him, I think he shut down. Bo Pelini did the same thing. Uh, uh, but in this case, but in this case, Matt Rule understands, and I think Nebraskans connected with him today. I don't think Bo shut down, Jimmy. I mean, he, the he record, did at the uh, end. I mean, at the end, yeah. Sip, he had somebody shopping, getting groceries for him. He wouldn't even come out of his house. Well, and, and he had a chancellor that pushed out Coach Osborne and oh, brought yeah. in AD to yeah. fire him. He oh, knew yeah. it. He knew oh, it. yeah. Yeah. He knew yeah, no. It, it, look, Bo, 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 was, yeah, Bo created a lot of his own problems, but he had internal forces against him that should never have happened. Absolutely. There's no question. Dean uh, hit us in the super chat with ten dollars. Uh, Thanks, no, Dean. No question, but thank you, Dean. Thank um, you, Dean. Um, Seriously, <laughs> we appreciate it, <laughs> no, Dean. I'm, and they call me Dean on the Red Sea Scrolls because yeah. it was a joke. Somebody mistyped the S and the D is right by each other on a keyboard, so I'm, I'm referred to <laughs> as Dean on the internet. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you'll always be deemed us often, but Hey, uh, Rosie, we appreciate you joining us. Um, we, yeah, we really do topped out, I believe over 1300 live viewers mm. still watching the show right now. So, Great. Uh, one well, so I hope shows. I didn't hog the conversation. Sean. Oh, thanks well, for you, that. Know, you make a lot of sense and we, I really have enjoyed you coming on and I hope you continue to do so. I really well, anytime, anytime you'd like to have me in to fill some space. And I, by the way, I stand corrected. I believe actually, because I went back and looked, I think actually Matt Rule at Temple beat James Franklin in his first year. It wasn't Bill O'Brien. Okay. I think it was James Franklin, but I, I wasn't sure about that. So I went back and looked Thank while you. you guys were, you know, picking up the slack. So we yeah. want to make sure we're on target with stuff, but it's great talking to you. I applaud you guys for how you covered this whole, a wonderful little uh, roller coaster ride of ours. Let's hope that we can break this four year cycle of doing this every four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, make, we all know that the hire in 1972 worked out. Um, you know, maybe the ones since then haven't done as well. Maybe we can, you know, stretch it out another five, six, 10, 15 years with this 47 year old. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. Well, hey, guys, thank you. And make sure you log on to HuskerOnline.com. Uh, we'll have full coverage. We'll have the podcast version of this up as well. If you want to take it in your car on the way to work and could it and watch the video live, uh, we'll have it all on the podcast channel as well. But HuskerOnline.com, all the coverage up, $25, gets you one year of access all the way until the start of football season. No better time to join for Trey Yannity, our back-end producer. Thank you very much. Uh, you made the show look great, as yeah, good always. Job. Good job. Uh, we'll be back again uh, with more coverage here. Thanks again on Husker Online.